Okay, then I will hand over to our next talk, which is called Pico Newton Sensitive Biosensors to Investigate Molecular Forces in Cells by Carsten Grashoff. And as Ali mentioned in the beginning, um, Carsten is, is one of the reasons why we actually have this meeting. So it was just, I guess, two sentences on the floor to me that uh, we should come in contact with Ali for a kind of uh, this meeting. And then um, we started with this and um, there were several well, similar things going on in Munich who was who, with Steffen Dietzel, they were thinking about a, fem, a similar meeting. So we decided to do it together. Um, yeah, some words about Carsten. So Carsten uh, did his uh, diploma thesis at the Robert Koch Institute in Berlin. Um, and then he worked as a PhD student or did his uh, PhD at the Max Planck Institute of Biochemistry in Munich um, in 2007. And he moved on as a postdoc uh, to work at the University of Virginia in the USA. And in 2010, he was there awarded with the Emmy Noether Fellowship and then started an independent group um, at the Max Planck Institute for Biochemistry. In 2014, he obtained the Paul Gerson Owner Fellowship from the Max Planck Foundation. And since 2018, he is now or has a professorship in, uh, for quantitative cell biology in Münster. And um, yeah, since two years, we are working here, I'm not together, but at the same place. So I also started 2018. And yeah, Carson got a lot of uh, different awards. So including the Early Career Award from the German National Academy of Science 2014 and the Binder Innovation Award 2018 from the Society of Cell Biology. So Carsten, thanks a lot. And I'm really looking forward, forward to your talk. Well, thanks, Thomas. Uh, can, can you hear me? If you just not, not that I am uh, wonderful. Thanks for the introduction. Um, it's actually great uh, also to see Ali back and it's great to see that that such a short interaction that we had in Dresden, uh, you know, became this meeting with, with more than hundreds of people. I mean, congratulations. That's really great. Um, and I'm happy to be here. Um, the, happy to have the opportunity to tell us a little, about, a little bit about why we are actually using FLIM at all. So this talk will be actually more explaining the background to why we are using FLIM to begin with. And I think this is a good question that everyone should uh, ask himself at some point, because FLIM is not, you know, it's, it's, it's a wonderful technique, but it's not easy. And um, the question is, why do you really need to use it? And uh, I would like to give you a little bit of background why we ended up using FLIM in our, in our laboratory. And uh, that will probably also help you understanding a little bit the, the workshop that we prepared for, for Wednesday. And as you can see from the title and maybe also from the picture here a little bit, so we are interested actually in mechanical forces that act in cells. And you may wonder what does this have to do with flim microscopy? So I hope I can uh, explain this to you in the coming uh, next 30 minutes or so. So um, the, to, to explain why, why we are doing these experiments that I will show you in a second, I just have to go a step back and actually um, tell you that um, this is some background that we constantly have in mind. Uh, and, uh, you know, the background is that our tissues are constantly exposed to mechanical signals, all kinds of signals. I just show you here three very prominent tissues. Um, and I show these ones because you know from your daily life experience that these tissues are exposed to quite significant mechanical um, forces. For example, the, the skeleton, you know, when you go jogging or something, you all know that this has quite a tremendous impact on how your cells in your bone will behave. You also know the story from the astronaut that goes to space and loses bone density. This is because bone cells feel, you know, the mechanical stimulation when you, um, you know, when you run or, you know, mechanical forces from gravity. And here you see muscles, of course, everyone knows if you exercise a lot, you, you know, your muscles grow. This is because your muscles sense and respond to mechanical signals. And this here maybe not as obvious, but you also heard all of you that, you know, our vascular system is 
regulated to a large degree by blood pressure and uh, of course the cells in our blood vessels they sense the shear forces from the blood flow and i could go on with this um, and actually go through any tissue that you want um, what you will find is that actually all cells that we know have the ability to sense and respond to mechanical signals in one way or the other yeah and this is for those of you who are maybe more interested in plants or in prokaryotes this is true for every life form that we know. All life forms that we know, they are in some way sensitive to mechanical signals and they can deal uh, with, with these sort of information very, in, in a very, very intelligent way. Uh, it is important for us because um, this dysfunctional processing of mechanical signaling um, leads to a, a whole range of disorders. Again, I show you, you know, just a few tissues um, and you don't have to think much to find disorders in these different tissues that are associated with the inability to process mechanical signals. For example, muscular dystrophy, osteoporosis, epidermolysis. This is a very terrible disease of the skin where the skin cannot respond properly to mechanical signals and ruptures in the end. Cardiomyopathy is, of course, also very important and you know, dangerous disorder where your heart muscle cells do not respond properly to, to mechanical stimulations. Artesclerosis is also a very famous disorder that actually, for those of you who don't know, originates in areas of your blood vessels that are um, bent, for example. In these areas, the blood flow is usually turbulent and the cells in the blood vessels, they sense that. And there is where your blood vessels start forming these plugs that in the end, turn, uh, you know, you will develop into artery sclerosis. So um, you could argue, you know, if this is the case, if all cells are um, able to sense mechanical forces, and if this is important for our tissues to function, well, then we have to understand how this actually works. And um, now I break it down a little bit more. Of course, there is a very good understanding about this already. Um, this is an exemplary tissue, the nipetilium could be the skin, for example, and we have already quite a good understanding how such tissues function mechanically. What we know, for example, is that there are distinct adhesion complexes in these tissues that, first of all, hold the tissue together. And these are also the same structures that allow tissues to sense and respond to mechanical signals. So, for example, these are adherence junctions. You probably have heard them. You know, cell cell junctions that uh, contain catarines and catenines and these structures, they connect to the actin cytoskeleton. So they're very, very important for cell cell adhesion. In our tissues, if you work with Drosophila, it won't be desmosomes, but in our tissues, there are desmosomes, also cell cell contact proteins that connect to the intermediate filaments. If you lack these two, your skin will fall apart. Same is true for focal adhesions. These are protein complexes that bind the cells to the underlying basement membrane. So they contain of integrin receptors and these integrin receptors also connect to the actin cytoskeleton through proteins like tailin. And they're also hemidesmosomes, you know, also integrins that do a very similar job and connect to the intermediate filaments. So, so this is something that we know actually. And we also know many of the components that are in these complexes. But what you could ask now is, well, we know that these structures are important for transducing mechanical signals, but how are they actually doing that? So how high are these forces and, you know, when and where do these forces occur? And um, how, you know, is this regulated by other signaling mechanisms? So if you wanted to understand that, well, then you have to start developing techniques that can actually uh, help you determine these, these open questions. And in order to explain this a little bit more, I will focus on the focal adhesions. So the technique that we have developed has been applied to all kinds of um, structures by now. And I will focus on focal adhesions because there it's very easy to understand how I, our experiments work. So these are focal adhesions. Most of you have probably heard of those structures. They are structures that, first of all, mediate the attachment of cells to the extracellular matrix. So these focal adhesions are necessary that your cells uh, hold themselves to the connective tissue in your body. And um, everyone that had cells already in culture, in a cell culture dish, um, will have more or less consciously used integrins because these are the receptors that allow your cells to bind to the plastic dish. Um, 
and well, oops, here was a question coming up too early actually. So, so the focal adhesions are these structures that you see here in this pinkish color, right? So these are the feet of the cell if you want, and they connect the extracellular environment to the intracellular actin cytoskeleton. And when you look from this side, you can see that integrin receptors are the surface receptors that are sticking out of the cell. So now here it's upside down. Here below is the glass surface or the extracellular matrix. Here the integrin receptors, the plasma membrane. And these integrin receptors connect to the actin cytoskeleton, but they don't do this directly. They cannot. They rely on these focal adhesion proteins. And these are proteins that you maybe have heard before. Talin is one of them, vinculin, paxlin proteins that are also adhesion proteins, and what they do is they connect integrins to the actin cytoskeleton. So this is also something that we know. We know that focal adhesions transduce mechanical forces in a b-directional fashion into the cell and out of the cell. These structures do more. They also do chemical signaling, but we know mechanically these are the structures that we have to understand. But if you look at it, well, you could, um, could ask, well, we know that forces are generated by traction force microscopy, for example. You can show this very nicely that forces are generated below such a focal adhesion, adhesion, but which proteins are actually transducing these forces, right? If you really want to understand molecularly how this works, this is what you have to answer. And this is quite difficult to answer because the forces um, that you can expect on individual molecules, they become very small on the molecular level. So they are in the range of around one to 15 piconewton, more or less. Yeah? So there are, of course, exceptions to the rule, but forces are not uh, typically not as high as like 100 piconewton or so. That would mean uh, if you exert 100 piconewton on your protein, that your protein unfolds. Uh, it denatures when you pull so much on a single protein. So this is not what cells do. Of course, the proteins remain intact when you stimulate them mechanically. So they just unfold a little bit, you know, open, change their conformation, and maybe then a site can be phosphorylated or another protein can bind. And, and the forces that you require for that, these are these very low piconewton forces. And this is what we want to measure. So for that, you need a trick. And this is a trick. And now here we come to the Fred and Flynn part, um, because this is a biosensor that we have developed uh, more than 10 years ago now. And this is a sensor that allows us to determine molecular tension um, by Fred Flynn measurements. So for those of you, I mean, I guess many of you are, are you know, know what FRET is, I guess, all by now. So it consists of a donor and an acceptor fluorophore. And these fluorophores, you know, they undergo FRET. So we originally used TFP and Venus. Now we use other fluorophores, as you will see, but, you know, a FRET pair. And um, this FRET pair is connected genetically by an elastic linker peptide. And the linker peptide is chosen in a way that it's, extends when mechanical forces are applied. This is actually not a trivial thing because most, I just told you, most proteins don't respond to these very tiny forces. So we needed to find something that can extend when you pull with a few piconewton on this biosensor so that the construct, this linker elongates, separates the full force and you lose FRET. You know, if you have something like this, then you can correlate your FRET efficiency with the forces that apply to the construct. So the only thing that you have to take away from this slide is, well, in this biosensor's mechanical tension that is applied on this biosensor reduces FRET. Yeah? And well, the big question is, of course, uh, what sort of linker do you put in there? And well, um, the original one, I always show this still, um, I like to show this because it was kind of a neat idea. So we, we inserted a peptide that you can find in spider silk. So spider silk is, of course, something very elastic. And turns out that there's a protein in spider silk called flageliform that you can extend very easily with a few piconewton. And um, if you let go of this thing, it behaves like an uh, entropic elastomere. The protein will snap back and, uh, and go to its original position. So it's also reversible. And at the time, we thought, well, this, this could be really the sort of linker that we need, you know, between our two FRET fluorophores because that should allow us to have exactly these properties, you know, very responsive to small forces and reversible. And this is exactly what we inserted between these two fluorophores and then single molecule calibrated that. I will show you more about this. I just want to mention it already now that if you do this, of course, you have to demonstrate experimentally somehow that your idea also works. So originally we did it 
in, in this way that we really recorded on single molecule level the uh, you know intensities of donor and acceptor, and then we applied the force and recorded, calculated the FRET efficiency. And what you can see here is that whenever you apply the mechanical force, your FRET efficiency really drops. And when you let go of this, FRET efficiency comes up again. So here you can see uh, the accumulated data of these experiments. You can see that you, know, you have a reasonably high FRET efficiency that then you can reduce this one to six picanewton forces. And you see two things here, actually. You see a red curve and uh, blue data points. So one is a stretch, when you stretch, and the other data points are when you let go and you relax. So you can see this thing is actually really reversible. So I will talk again about this, uh, uh, about this sort of calibration, but it's important to keep in mind that this calibration is important if in the end you want to, uh, want to correlate your FRET efficiency to your force, because if you have something like this, and you measure a FRET efficiency with your FLIM experiment, then you can ideally, of course, there are a couple of assumptions to that, but then you can ideally um, um, co uh, correlate the, the, the FLIM FRET efficiencies with actual molecular forces. So originally we inserted that into Winkelin, and I just showed this slide, not because it's recent data, it's still old data from 10 years ago, but we will use this uh, construct in the workshop to show you how we, uh, we actually performed this experiment. So initially we inserted this uh, tension sensor into Winkley. So you have to take this biosensor and stick it into your molecule of interest. Well, you know, of course, the chances that you mess up your protein of interest are not bad. So you have to think about how you can actually insert this biosensor in your protein without disturbing the functionality. Uh, for Winkley, that S was actually straightforward because people had done similar things before, not with tension sensors, but they had inserted GFPs and so on into Winkley. And you can do that because Winkley has a head domain that binds tailing, has a tail domain that binds actin, and we inserted this tension sensor between these two domains, expressed this construct in Winkley knockout cells, very similar to how we will do it in the workshop, and then uh, recorded, you know, threads with flim microscopy. And these are, you know, I don't want to explain the data too much. Uh, you know, that just allows you to record the lifetimes, calculate the thread efficiencies. And since we have a calibration, correlate these thread efficiencies with actually real forces that uh, are occurring in this case on Winkley. So this is a basic idea. And um, we have continued doing that actually, um, illustrated here already by, uh, biosensors with slightly different colors so now we use uh, yellow and red fluorophores. I can explain you then in the workshop uh, later uh, which ones these are. And we have tried to make this a little better. So we established really a, a pipeline to develop new biosensors, single molecule calibrate them. And by now we have um, a whole range of uh, biosensors that allow us to read out mechanical forces in different ranges. So this one that I showed you here, this, this spider silk one is a blue one, you know, it's sensitive to forces of one, two, uh, six, seven piconewton, I would say, but we have better ones for now. We have a new one that is almost digital in its response, you know, this FL sensor and other sensors that sense higher forces. And so, so just that you believe me that this actually works. So we have used this over the last years and it does work. I'm not saying it's easy, but it can work. So if you manage to insert this sort of biosensors into your molecule without destroying the molecule, then you can really learn something mechanically um, with these sort of experiments. And I, you know, also important that this has been used by many other research labs by now. So I want to give you in the remaining part of my talk a little bit of flavor of how these experiments look like and what we can, what sort of things we can learn with it. And uh, for that, I want to show you uh, data on uh, actually a molecule we now work a lot on, and that is called tailing. So tailing is a molecule that is also in this uh, focal adhesion area, and it's a very, very important molecule because it's an integrin activator. So if you look at the domain structure of tailing, you can see it has you know, two big large domains, uh, an N-terminal integrin binding site domain, and that is a the part of the molecule that binds to integrins and activates integrin receptors. And this is really important because if you don't do that, you have inactive integrins and your cells will not be able to adhere to surfaces. Okay. And that's why tailing was actually very famous before we started working on it because it is an integrin activator. Well, when you look at the molecule, you can also see 
that there is a big rod domain, as we say. So a large domain that has actin binding sites in there, it also binds vinculin, you know, the protein that uh, I just showed you before. So it binds these other molecules and people wondered, well, what, what is this good for? And, you know, you can guess already that this is probably a molecule that does not only activate integrins, it probably also connects directly to the actin cytoskeleton. And this we wanted to directly prove. There was no proof for that. So we thought, well, let's take uh, these biosensors that we have and insert it between this integrin binding head domain yeah, and the actin binding rod domain and see whether when this protein is incorporated in the focal adhesion is really being exposed to mechanical tension. And uh, well, before I do that, I want to again make one step back and tell you a little bit about how important it is to calibrate this technique. So when we started these experiments, we had this first spider silk um, tension sensor um, that was sensitive to one to six piconewton. But we were a little bit worried because tailin has so many actin and vinculin binding sites that we thought, well, maybe it just binds much more, uh, it's, it's ex exposed to much higher forces than just this uh, one to six piconewton. So maybe we need something that is actually sensitive to higher forces. Otherwise, we will not really make a good measurement. We are always maxed out with your biases. And so we came out with a new sensor. And I want to explain on this one a little bit what you have to pay attention to if you want to make such a tension sensor. So this construct is called the HP35 sensor. And the first important thing is that it's small, right? If you insert something between your fret pair that is large, then you will not get any fret to start. Right? These things have to be close to each other, these two fluid force. So you need something that has a close N to C terminal distance. Right? Um, then you need to be able to unfold this structure um, with forces you're interested in. And HP35, we knew, uh, you know, has a sensitivity to 6 to 8 piconewton approximately. You want this um, also to refold. I told you it doesn't help you all that much if this thing unfolds and never goes back, then you cannot make a physiologically relevant measurement. So you really want to have that it refolds and that it refolds very quickly, ideally without any hysteresis. That means the unfolding and the refolding pathways should be identical. HP35 does that. This refolding response should be also fast. It also doesn't help you if it refolds and it takes half an hour because most of the processes we are all interested in are faster than that. So this HP35 folds back in the sub microsecond time scale, and that is actually really important. And, you know, I mean, maybe you have a, uh, such a peptide that you can mutate and, and we actually found stabilizing mutations that allow us to keep all these properties intact, but just shift the force sensitivity. Well, and uh, then, of course, we calibrated that. And I want to spend a minute or so on showing you how this actually now looks in real life, because I always show you this scheme here, and that is actually completely out of scale. It's completely raw. Yeah? So I want to show you a movie from... Matthias Reeves' lab, he is an excellent physicist at the TU in Munich and a, a you know, collaborator of us. And he made this movie that illustrates how this actually looks like such a calibration. And I play this movie for you. So this is how these beads actually look like. And these red things, these are the laser traps. So you hold with a laser trap two beads. And between these two beads, there is your single molecule. And it is attached with long DNA handles to the beads. So here's your protein in the middle and you attach this protein with DNA handles to these beads. And you hold these beads, you know, with your laser trap. So actually something that is important is that, you know, you have to find chemistry to link your protein to the DNA. And, you know, you can do this with malimid chemistry. And Matthias and his folks actually spent quite some time to illustrate this as as real as possible, you see it's jiggling. And this is the Brownian motion because sub piconewton forces um, give you already this motion and it tells you already how low these forces are, right? I mean, the protein jiggles at these low forces because um, you need to be really sensitive. And this is a little bit of, you know, simplified illustration of your DNA binding to your protein. Well, then what you do is you use one laser trap and move the bead and exert a force on that beat. And of course, also on this construct. And at some point, this construct will unfold. Yeah? And this is a moment where you record that event. And then you can let go of this uh, uh, laser trap. You just move it back a little bit and reduce the force again. And then at some point, the protein will refold. 
and you can measure how fast it takes um, this refolding and so on. And you do this experiment you know, on and on. And so you can get all sorts of data out that regard the folding, unfolding properties of your, of your peptide. And because of these experiments, we really know that we unfold our peptide at these forces. Yeah? We can discuss the limitations of this technique later on. Of course, this is not an in vivo measurement, but this, this is as close as you can get, I would say, to calibrate your senses. And this is really important that you know what you have. So very briefly, this is what we did here. You see how these data look like. You have here this unfolding curves here. You see this jiggling. This is a Brownian motion, which becomes less the higher the forces are. You see two lines, a colored line and a gray line. This is unfolding and refolding. And these are the two sensors, right? One is the HP35 tension sensor. The other one, the stabilized version. So this one here, it unfolds between six and eight piconewton. You know, you see the diversion from this curve here. If there would be just DNA between your beads, you would be on this curve, but it, you are not on that curve because a protein in between the bead unfolds and you get this slight extension. And well, this happens at six to eight and yet nine to 11 piconewton, you can model this and use the first equation to then actually calculate uh, sensitivities of your bias sensor. So this is a curve that I showed you before. It's basically the first derivative of the Fred efficiency over force curves that you see here. Okay, so uh, just wanted to make the point, it's really important to calibrate these sensors because as you all know, FLIM is complicated enough. If you don't understand your bias sensor, then uh, also, then in the end, you don't understand anything. So at least we try to, you know, make sure we understand more or less these bias sensors. Um, and then, you know, the idea was let's put it into, uh, into our cells. And I told you, it's important that you, um, that you, that you, have a protein that is still functional in case of tailing, that was actually quite easy to test because if you make a knockout of tailing, actually of tailing one and tailing two, you end up with a cell that cannot uh, sit down and adhere and spread. And you can ask, okay, these bias sensors that we generate, can they rescue that? Can uh, a normal tailing that you see here, this would be just a normal tailing, can this construct rescue the tailing knockout phenotype? And can the tension sensor construct also do that? And this is a really important control because just sticking the sensor into a protein, of course, can also really harm your protein of interest. So this is a control that is very important to do. Um, there is a very important FRET control that you also need. And this is this one here where, we, where you insert the tension sensor module, this bias sensor, at some point, uh, at some area of the protein where you do not expect force. So for example, it's a C-terminus. If it's at the C terminus, then there can be nothing pulling on this construct. So this is important always to have these measurements in parallel with your tension sensor measurements to really make sure that if you observe a threat efficiency, that that is really caused by force. Because I don't have to tell you, or at least you will learn in the coming days, threat is sensitive to all kinds of things. And you have to control for this. And we will, I will also emphasize this like really a lot in the workshop um, that this is a control that you really need to always measure together with this one. And, you know, there are a couple of, actually a couple, quite a lot of um, protocols and reviews that we wrote on all the other controls that you need to make. These are not all of them, there are more, but these are, these are the most important ones. The functionality control and the threat control. And, you know, for those of you that are concerned that mm, maybe it does not really rescue talian function, so we did it also in flies, so we made a knockout fly, rescued uh, with CRISPR-Cas actually inserted the tension sensor into the endogenous tailing locus and these flies are completely normal and since tailing is such an important molecule that tells you that tailing is probably really uh, still functional. Okay so just a few slides uh, of how the data then actually look like. So you take cells that express either your control, yeah, this threat control or your tension sensor and then you start measuring with FLIM um, what kind of threat efficiencies you get. And here you see uh, two, uh, this is a control and we either can see the cells on fibronectin or on polylysin. On both cases, we would expect a high threat efficiency because I told you this, this concept should not respond to forces and it doesn't. If you have a cell that expresses a state intention sensor, it's different because on fibronectin, cells form focal adhesions and then tailing is in focal adhesions. And then, you know, it should be, uh, exposed to mechanical forces and that should lead to the opening of the sensor and the reduction in threat efficiency and that's what you see here. On polyelizin this effect is not pronounced because on polyelizin cells basically do not form for 
regions. So it's sort of an internal contour. And when you do this sort of experiments, you can learn, okay, tailing is under seven piconewton or so. Um, you can, of course, also do ratiometric imaging um, with this construct. You don't have to do FLIM, but FLIM allows us to really calculate the actual forces because we directly determine the fret efficiency. This you cannot easily do with ratiometric fret imaging. And the new Pico, you know, we used to do ratiometric frets to get spatial temporal details out of our experiments. That was coming from a time where the FLIM system were not that fast, but they are faster now. And so now you, uh, with this increased sensitivity can, can also determine the spatial temporal details with FLIM quite, quite nicely actually. Okay, so one more slide of how these data actually look like. So what we found for tailing is, this is again a control, but first of all, there's a difference between tailing one and tailing two. So tailing one is a protein that is under force, tailing two is actually under more force. Um, this depends on the protein vinculine, you know, vinculine binds to tailing and it's important. If you do this experiment, um, not in tailing knockout cells, but in you know, fibroblasts where the vinculine gene is marked, you see the same thing, uh, high, you know, some force on tailing one, more force on tailing two, but this effect is sensitive to vinculine because if you knock out vinculine, then forces go up. So fret efficiencies go up, forces go down, and the difference between tailing one and tailing two is gone. You know, and then you can go on, and unfortunately I don't have all the time, and uh, maybe good for you, then you don't have to listen to all my, my data here. Um, you know, you can do all sorts of experiments here. We made chimeric constructs to find out, okay, this difference between tailing one and tailing two, where does it come from? The head domain that binds intervenes or the rod domain, so it turns out it comes from the rod domain. And well, you can go on and on and on, but now I'm coming back. Why are we doing this actually? You know, this is a lot of work for maybe measuring something that's trivial to some of you. Well, these proteins are under tension, so what's, what's, it, what's it mean? So for tailing, it's actually really important that we figure that out because it turns out tailing is really important to have this function. Because if you generate a cell that can activate intervenes, but it cannot build up this tension on the rot domain. So this is this mutant that you see here, then you lose a whole lot of functions. All proteins are normal in these cells. Just this one ability to carry these mechanical loads is lost. And then you have cells that cannot generate traction forces. They cannot reinforce adhesions when you stimulate contractility. This is what folk adhesions do, right? They, they hold tighter if you activate myosin, for example, in cells. So this is what cells also cannot do. And they lose the ability to sense the extracellular rigidity. This is what cells can do. For example, when you have a tumor, tumor is stiff. Cells benefit from that a lot because they can, can sense the stiffness of this tumor. And uh, if you take away this linkage, tailing a linkage, then cells cannot do that anymore. They cannot sense anymore whether there's a soft or a stiff substrate outside. This is shown in this data here that I unfortunately do not really have so much time to talk about as I realize. Okay, so the conclusions of this is basically, okay, there are these molecular tension sensors. If you are calibrating them, then they can be used together with FLIM to determine molecular forces. Of course, there are a lot of other things that you have to pay attention to. And I refer to some of the reviews there, so it's not all, but you, this can be done. Um, you can, of course, when you do flim measurements, not only determine how many, uh, how much force you have on a protein of interest, you can also determine how many uh, proteins of interest are actually under force. What's the percentage from 100 molecules? Is it 50%, 80% of molecules being under tension? If you do B exponential fitting of your flim data, you can, you can figure that out. Uh, and overall, you know, we learned, okay, you, tailing is critical for extracellular rigidity sensing. So I think this is this really helps us doing this experiment. Um, so in that case, uh, apply, applying FLIM uh, really makes sense. So what we learn from all these experiments is that many of these adhesion proteins, they, they bear piconeutin forces and tension is subject to molecular regulation. So this is, you know, this of course much more complicated than I just showed you. Um, I come back to this slide, I'm almost done, but here uh, I just want to point out that this is different uh, for other uh, of these adhesion complexes. Not all of them are constantly under force. So we have another paper on desmosomes, and when you measure the same thing in desmosomes on the protein desmoplakin, you will find, well, these structures are not always under force. These desmosomes are especially uh, good for sensing and responding to externally applied and this explains why our tissue really falls apart in the absence of desmosomes when you pull on it. 
So there are patients, babies, that can completely develop without their small plaque in, but when they are born, their skin really comes off during the birth process because the skin cannot resist uh, these, these forces. And last but not least, you could of course say, well, now you can just look at one complex at a time. Can you not look at two complexes at, at a time? And of course we can do this by dual color flim. So we can, uh, and this is what some of my students do now in the lab, we can um, measure you know, two of these fluorescent biosensors of these tension sensors in parallel. This we have also published in Nature Methods where you excite with you know, pulse 440 laser, both constructs, but you can analyze it and spectrally separate windows uh, the fluorescence lifetime, and this allows you to actually measure two of these biosensors with dual color flim uh, at the same time. And this allows you to really look at several complexes at the same time in the same cell. So with that, I actually would like to uh, close so that we still have some time for questions. I would like to thank my group. These are the people that are now in my lab in Münster, but uh, the people that was really instrumental for, for performing these experiments I showed was, uh, was Kati. She was actually my first PhD student and Anna, she's still in my lab um, um, and, and many other, pro um, other, other people uh, that contributed to this work. Uh, I would like to thank Matthias, uh, not only because I showed this cool movie, but he's just an excellent physicist and helps us with the calibration. I could do it myself. So I totally rely on his expertise and Alex and Andreas. And, you know, a nice collaboration on the Desmo plugging project with Alex, Dan and Andrew. So thank you very much, guys, for your attention. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions if there are, if there are any. Yeah, thank you, Carsten, for, for this nice talk. And there, and there are there already are. Some, some questions. So no, hear me twice. Okay. Um, so we had some questions about um, how you calibrate um, um, the, the, the linker, or, but um, I guess you already mentioned this. So you're doing this with, with laser traps and um, also not you are doing this. So this was, was a link to Matthias Rief, so a biophysics or physics guy is, is, is doing this. So maybe in this direction also you, you explained this. So are you you're just calibrating the linker, not with the, with the proteins in between, or? Um, so now we really do it with the fluorescent proteins also. Okay. So we, we generate uh, the full tension sensor, we express it in cells, purify it from cells, and then calibrate the whole thing. And this is actually, I'm actually glad that you asked, because you also have to test that your fluorophores do not unfold, right? If that would happen, then your whole experiment is, uh, you know, will not work. And it turns out that GFPs, um, they unfold at around 35 to 40 piconewton. So this is way above um, our, you know, our, our forces that we're interested in. I would almost say, unfortunately, because if you could just insert a GFP into your protein of interest, that would be easier. And so, sorry to say it, I wouldn't have to do flim then, right? I would just look at the image and see the fluorescence disappear, but this doesn't work. So, yeah, but now we actually, I, I'm very glad that we did this now. So we do the full thing now, calibrate everything. Okay, see, thanks. So the other question was about controls from uh, Stephanie Walkan-Peters, but I guess you, you showed that you have to do the controls. And I guess we will also see this in, in the workshops that controls are always uh, very important um, to understand yeah. what you're doing. We also have a very specific question from Pavel. So he asked, um, because he showed the lifetimes, the, the changes in the fit efficiency. So he, he, he asked, what is this fit efficiency changing of 25 or 15 percent really means in the lifetime of your fluorescence? Yeah. So, you know, you have seen that the lifetime differences are um, not very large. And um, I have to say that um, these initial experiments, they are really 10 years ago. And in that case, we really averaged about uh, everything. And we were at that point also not very good at uh, analyzing our data because this was uh, analyzed with a Bruno exponential uh, fitting. But if you think about this now a little bit more, then you can actually expect uh, B exponent data that are fitted by B exponential uh, fits, right? Because you can at least expect two populations, a closed tension sensor construct and an open tension sensor construct. And so, um, if you take that into account and you try to tease apart these sort of 
fractions, then actually these differences become uh, quite pronounced uh, and easier to see. But if you just average everything, then um, you know the differences are very small. But that's part of the reason I just showed you here um, the average of all molecules that we imaged. Right. So you have a focal adhesion, thousand molecules inside, and I just average that and take the average lifetime. But what actually happens, of course, is that you know. 50% of these molecules will not be under tension at all, right? And if you know okay. that, you can correct for this. This is yeah. this ratio trick. Maybe we can go on with the, the last two questions. So one from Stefan Ivald Campeters. So can you comment on other sensor systems that potentially provide a higher dynamic range? Um, for tension sensor measurements? Yeah. So if, if that, you know, honestly, I'd like to be here, but if I could find something that makes my measurement uh, easier uh, and still guarantees me that I can sense picolutin forces and I have a reversibility and all these things, I would immediately do it. I, uh, and I was thinking long about it, but I haven't come up with anything. So um, this is still the best way of, um, that, that we could come up with to measure these sort of forces in cells. I mean, it's also genetically encoded and so on. We all want this, they are DNA sensors and so on but they're all not applicable to inside cell measurements. So yeah, for what we want to do, uh, that's still the best. What about this, maybe I can directly ask, um, because um, here we have the, the Proma group from, it's the plant community working with plant and they are using now these Matryoshka sensors. So it's intensiometric, but they make it ratio matrix by um, inserting also another fluorescent protein as a reporter and they, make the statement that's much more, you have a much higher dynamic range than with FRET. Ah, I mean, FRET is super is, robust, but of course it's it's limited. So you have only these small changes and we are also struggling with that. And um, have you considered so, this or? So like, like changing the fluid force, trying to increase the dynamic range. That's, that's basically the question. Um, so we, we have tried you know, several fluor force. And I have to say, uh, I, you know, in my experience, the papers are then not as, you know, the results are not as fulfilling as, as, you, as your expectation is, right? I mean, to be honest, um, we also do not like to change it all that much because now we have biosensors that we really calibrated also. And when I change on the fluor force, in principle, I would also have to recalibrate that. And, but, you know, I mean, we tried really quite a lot of things, all sorts of combinations. It really hasn't improved much. But again, uh, the average threat efficiency that we have here is, you know, what I showed, the 30% is average threat efficiency. If you take out the fraction, that is actually uh, really fretting because what also, in addition, uh, you have to keep in mind is that some of the acceptors will just not mature. This has been shown by Don Lamp. This is actually quite a significant fraction. So 40% of your biosensors anyway do not fret because uh, the acceptors are not matured. I would not say folded, but probably not matured. So if you take that into account, you end up with a, with a fret efficiency that is already 60%, right? Something like this. So uh, I think they're, you know, changing fluid force probably don't help all that much because there are other issues that prevent you from getting this really good fret efficiencies. Yeah. Okay. But I... Thanks for the question. I think about this all the time, this sort of stuff. <laughs> One last question because I know we have them all. Very short answer. Have you used or can you use phaser blots for your analysis? I'm sure it can be done, we haven't, but we haven't done it. Okay. So that's. So with this, um, Carsten, thanks again for, for your talk. And we will go yeah. on to our next speaker.